Hello everyone. Today I'm going to discuss lexical cohesion, which you may find that the, the theory is easier than other forms of cohesion we've discussed. There are quite a few details, but it's easy in theory at least because now we're talking just about how the meaning of words shows us that they are linked and thus that those words in different parts of a text help contribute to the cohesion. As you know, we're talking about properties of language as a text, right, as a collection of words, phrases, clauses that all belong together through these cohesive properties. Uh, I didn't use the term grammatical cohesion before, but you can think of it as things we've talked about thus far. It re they relied on your knowledge of grammar to see how the links were made, right? With reference, substitution, and ellipsis. Uh, with reference, you see a reference like she. You have to know something about grammar, right? You have to know that she is uh, a pronoun and it's a subject pronoun. And so you have to look around in the text for other possible nouns, for, for nouns that she could possibly refer to. And similarly for substitution and ellipsis, you remember terms like nominal, verbal, clausal, ellipsis, uh, to know how something works in, a, in, a, in an elliptical gap, you'd have to realize that part of a verb, for example, is missing, and then look around in the text to see where you can recover that verb, where you can make the interpretation of what's missing. So you're relying on grammar, right? And similarly for conjunction, they show us the grammatical links between different parts of the text, different Clause is often sometimes a phrase in a clause, right? That they show us uh, some grammatical connection between two otherwise separate elements, often two separate clauses. With lexical cohesions, you'll see it's on a separate line here because it's not, the, you don't need to know about grammar to understand what's going on with lexical cohesion. You just have to know what words mean and then describe for our purposes, know what they mean and then describe the relation between words with related meanings with some precision. So there's there's quite a lot of detail here if you look at the colored uh, boxes down below where it says lexical cohesion. But as I said, I think if you just keep in mind that we're just talking about the fact that words have meaning and when we see words with the same or related meaning, we can therefore say that they belong, likely belong to the same text. The, the, some of the words down below, I imagine you know already, perhaps synonym, collocation, right? Uh, we'll go over them one by one, and by the end you should know what all of these mean and how they contribute to the cohesion of a text. So here's a good example, right? Imagine you're reading a, a newspaper article, here's these four people, and how might they be referred to in that newspaper article? It might call them people, because of course they're people, uh, they might be called the band, uh, bandmates, Ringo and John, which are their first names. Uh, their family names could also be used instead, uh, or even by their name as a band, the Beatles, right? If you saw these in a newspaper article, that would help you understand that all of the different parts belong together, right? If it says the Beatles, uh, you know, the Beatles were one of the most, one of the best-selling bands of all time. Uh, Lennon, Lennon and McCartney were uh, a songwriting duo that blah, blah, blah. Well, you'd see the relationship between these, right? Because, oh, Lennon and McCartney are members of the Beatles. And then if it said, uh, he played the guitar, he played the drums, that would further contribute because you'd say, oh, music, guitar, drums, those words are related, right? The song was a song that's related. So really it's... Uh, in theory, just that simple, right? The, these words are all part of the same topic, let's call it for now, right? The Beatles, the Beatles members' names, the songs, the song names, words like melody and, and uh, rhythm and so on would all contribute through Lexis. Through the, Lexis means words, of course, right? I should have said that just to be careful, right? That through the lexical cohesion, through the words themselves, we see the links to different, in different parts of the text. Ah, yes, their nickname as well, the Fab Four. Uh, okay, 
Here, more uh, precisely, more formally, it's described by Lyons uh, some time ago, but I always think this is a nice quotation. Uh, you can pause and read it word by word, of course, uh, but it's that last line, uh, it is like a huge multi-dimensional spider's web, right? So that newspaper article about the Beatles would say the Beatles and Lennon and McCartney and song and concert, and they'd all be linked up together, right? And Beatles would go with Lennon and McCartney and song would go with concert because you sing songs at a concert, but song would also go with Lennon and McCartney because they wrote the song and so on. And you'd end up with all these drawing, you could draw lines between all the different words that are related to each other. And sometimes, of course, one word would be related to more than one other word and it would end up being this big web and you'd see, oh, look, all these are connected. It's obviously therefore a text and not just some random collection of words and phrases that someone stuck together as, a, as a, an art project or something. Uh, so, as I said, lexical cohesion, referring to different things, uh, referring to things in the text in different ways, right? Uh, you can have it as simple as this, didn't everyone expect the minister to resign? They did, but the man refused. Now you're going to see the man here and you're going to realize that the man here must mean the minister. Not very complicated, right? Uh, how do you know that? Well, you could compare it to grammatical cohesion, he, where he, the pronoun he, anaphorically refers to the minister. So you could use a pronoun. Uh, instead, this person has used the man. Now, the important part here is to think about how man doesn't presuppose anything on its own, right? Think of it if I say, I saw a man walking down the street. I saw a man walking down the street. You wouldn't expect from hearing, I saw a man, you'd just say, okay, fine, a man. Some man doesn't matter who yet, right? If there may be more to the story. I saw a man. But if I say, I imagine if I just said, I saw the man walking down the street. Now, because you have the, which is a, a it's a pointing word, right? Uh, you may know it now as a demonstrative reference, although it's non-selective. It's not like this or that, uh, where you know something about the proximity, this man, that man, the man. Okay, so you've got, I saw the man walking down the street. You've got the, which does some pointing. So now you'd expect that man also becomes cohesive. The man here has to connect to something else, right? If I say, did you talk to the man? You may think, well, who's he talking about? I don't know enough. You expect the man because of the, working with man to point at someone specific. Whereas if I say a man, you don't expect that, right? There's no presupposition with a man. Whereas when you hear the man, you know that it presupposes you can figure out which man is being discussed, which man I'm talking about. That's just what it says here. Uh, I'm going to show, so that was just a, a quick overview of the type of thing to look for. And the first one here, which is called general nouns, is probably the one that you would be least familiar with. So in a way, it's best to do it first, right? To start with the one that may be a little more complex and then move on to the easier ones. So we've got general nouns, which are as I just described, and we'll see more in a minute, where you've got a word like man. Man on its own is very general. Man refers to half of the adult population of the human race, right? If you say a man, that's a lot of potential people. But as soon as you say the man, you know it's only going to refer to one specific man, assuming the text works, and therefore it's lexically cohesive. The man, you know, it's going to stick to something. Reiteration means saying the same thing again, but with a different word, as you see here, uh, a synonym, climb and ascend. But really, you're saying the same thing again, right? Uh, there's a few ways to do it, and we'll see them in, in detail in a minute. But reiteration, right? To reiterate, to say again. Collocation, if you don't know the term, look at how it's got location, right? Place, and then co, uh, meaning with, right? So collocation with place. That's a good way to remember it, right? Words that we expect to see with each other in the same place, 
or at least when you see one of them, it becomes much more likely that you'll see the other one, right? If you look at the example, why does this little boy wriggle all the time? Once you hear the word boy, there are a lot of collocations that become much more likely. Think of when you hear the word boy, what other words might appear with it? A little boy, a boy playing, girl and boy, right? It's, it's not that you have to say girl when you say boy, but once you say the word boy, once the word boy appears in a text, it becomes much more likely that collocations like girls and boys, little boys, uh, school boys, these kind of words become much more likely, so we call, and we call them collocations. Whereas if you hear the word boy, there are other words that may appear, uh, green, um, dollar, right? Those words may appear, but you don't have any expectation that they're more likely to appear because there's a mention of boys, right? So of course any word can appear, and collocations don't have to appear, but a collocation means that once two words that go together or appear together more often than random chance was, would suggest. Again, more examples coming. Okay, so general nouns, right? Look at these examples. You may want to pause here. Look for thing, words like man, where man can refer to a whole lot of people, right? Uh, any adult male human on the planet. Can you see those in what we have in front of here? Maybe one at a time, right? So if you go through this one and you think of a word like stuff, what can stuff mean, right? Stuff can mean pretty much two or more of anything, right? Uh, look at all this stuff on the ground. I've got a bunch of stuff in my head, right? Can you see how that's a, a very good example of a general noun? It's a noun, stuff. But it's so general in meaning that without more co-text or context, it, it's almost meaningless, right? Um, whereas in the example in front of you, what shall I do with all this crockery? And then the other person says, leave the stuff there. Ah, what does the stuff mean now? It means this crockery and only this crockery. Uh, whereas another time that it's used, someone says, I've got a bunch of stuff in my head. We th think stuff must mean something else. Uh, what's that stuff on the ground, right? Didn't I ask you to put that stuff away? Things like that. The, the word stuff takes on a different meaning because of the words that it appears with. So now you might be better at doing that and seeing that uh, move here fulfills that same function, right? Move here does not mean move like, you know, when you're in someone's way and they say, could you move please? Where it means the act of physically moving your body to the side. Think of here, move means keeping quiet. And you could use, in many other examples, you could use many other texts could have move mean something quite specific, like keep quiet, again, depending on which words it appears with. Uh, the place in this one, right? Uh, think of how the place here functions like the word there. I've never been there. Where's there? Geneva. I've never been to the place. The place here means some specific location, Geneva and only Geneva, whereas in another text, place could be used to refer to, well, any other location around the world, right? General nouns function like that. They have a meaning. Stuff means something. Move means something. Place means something. But the meaning is quite general. And when you use it in a text, and especially as you see here with the place, the best, the stuff, it now refers to something much more specific, right? It now means something, it's interpreted, that's the best word to use, you know it, right? The stuff is interpreted as crockery in this text. The best move is interpreted as keeping quiet. Uh, the place is interpreted as Geneva. I color coded them here. This list that's appearing here, and there's more on the next page, uh, comes from uh, Halliday and Hassan's book, Cohesion in English. It's not an exhaustive list. There are other examples, and, and you wouldn't expect to memorize these, but just 
think of how these examples here, people, person, man, woman, girl, these all mean something, right? They all do mean something that's true. Girl means, you know, female, young female human, uh, and so on. They do mean something, but we use them a lot and we use them, as you can see, if you if you pay attention to how they're used, they're often used in a way that, where they do refer to someone specific. It is always possible to say a girl, a woman, a man, a person, where it refers to someone non-specific. If I, again, if I say I saw a girl walking down the street, well, which girl? You have no way of knowing, right? But most of the time when these are used, they're used with a the girl, the man type situation where it does indicate someone specific uh, in a different part of the text where you expect to find out who the child is by looking back or looking forward. Other examples, uh, again, I wouldn't expect you to memorize these, but here's some other examples that Halliday and Hassan provide, uh, some really good ones here. Think of thing, right? How often do you use thing to refer not in definitely to a thing that the listener or reader can't possibly interpret, but some thing that can be interpreted from the context, pass me that thing, or from the co-text, oh, here's the thing I wanted to tell you last week, right? And then you know, uh, here's the thing I wanted to tell you last week. What's the thing? Whatever comes the next thing that I say, right? Uh, like that. Uh, so, uh, don't, uh, as I said, don't think that you should memorize these. It's just thinking of that theory that when we see the plus some nouns that have quite a general meaning, they usually refer actually quite specifically to some other part of the text. The appears, right? You could use this or that. Um, doesn't change how this works, right? Henry seems convinced there's money in dairy farming. I don't know what gave him that idea. I don't know what gave him the idea that there's money in dairy farming. Works the same way. You saw these examples earlier. You can see that there's no difference in meaning between he and the man. Uh, they are both interpreted as the minister. We have choice in how we talk and choice in how we write. Uh, there's no difference in how they're interpreted, but there's a difference in how you should describe them, right? He is a personal reference. The man is, man is a general noun. Reiteration, to move on to the second of the major categories, reiteration is where something is said again. Uh, and it, where the meaning, unlike with general nouns, where man is not very specific, right? Which man? With reiteration, the meaning of the word is specific, uh, but uh, so it, it's not the same, right, as, as a general noun. The meaning of the word is specific, uh, and it's the meaning of the word that allows us to see the link between different parts of the text, right? If you've read what you see in front of you here, you can probably make some guesses about the kind of things that I'm going to draw to your attention, right? If I asked you, how do you know that this is a text that these words all belong together in some coherent way, coherent, some way that makes sense, right? You remember that term, coherent, makes sense? Well, a pretty strong clue would be that we have pollen and all of these other forms of pollen, right? We have pollen, the noun, we have pollinated, the verb, we have pollination, the noun, which means the act of pollinating, uh, pollen is repeated exactly again, and then we have self-pollination, which repeats pollination and adds on the prefix self, right? So you'd say, you'd probably say, yeah, I guess because we see this word. I mean, even if, imagine even if you didn't know the word pollen, just seeing it in these repeated like this would be a pretty good clue that it's probably, you, you might say, well, I guess it's talking about the same thing because I see this word P-O-L-L a few times, but I don't know what that means, right? I mean, I'm not saying you don't know what it means, but imagine even if you didn't know what it means, you'd have a pretty strong clue. Imagine you're reading a different language and you saw the same letter combination several times, even if it was a bit different at the end, you'd probably feel like it was related even though you couldn't understand that word. We have the repetition of pollen over and over. But then we also have other things here, right? 
Uh, flower is repeated directly, sure. Stigma is repeated directly, sure. So all of these contribute even more to the sense that this is a cohesive text. Now, there is, so reiteration means to say it again. There are three subcategories which may contribute to the confusion here, and that's why I showed the uh, organizational chart at the start. Reiteration means to say it again. Stigma, stigma, flower, flower. But there are slight differences in the ways we can say things again. Sometimes it's this easy. We just say the exact word again, or the same head, the same root of the word, P-O-L-L-E-N, and then it's modified a bit to turn it into uh, the noun or the verb, the noun meaning the act of pollinating or the verb pollinate. That one should be pretty obvious, right? You repeat it again. A synonym, I imagine most of you know this word, synonym means same meaning different word, right? So I turned to climb the peak, the ascent was quite easy. Climb and ascend are synonyms, they mean the same thing and superordination and subordination. Long words, but not complex. Ordination, order, right? Things are in order. Super, superman, right? Uh, bigger, higher, better. Sub, submarine, sub-basement, lower, underneath, right? Super and sub, in the order. Ahead or behind in the order. Examples like this. She bought a new Jaguar. She loves that car. If you just heard she bought a new Jaguar, yeah, you'd probably have a pretty strong intuition that she bought a car, not the animal a Jaguar, fine. But once you hear she bought a new Jaguar, she loves that car, you know that Jaguar is a car because a Jaguar is a type of car. So think of it as an order. Car is higher up, lower down is Jaguar. It's a type of car. Car is the superordinate, Jaguar is the subordinate, and you could keep going higher or lower. If you have car, a car is a type of vehicle, so vehicle is a superordinate of car, car is a subordinate of vehicle, right? You could go up and down. A, a Jaguar, I don't know much about cars, but there are certain types of cars certain types of Jaguars. I believe one is called the XJS. So you have Jaguar and then XJS, right? An XJS is a type of Jaguar, therefore an XJS is a subordinate of Jaguar. Jaguar is the superordinate. I think I've never said the word Jaguar so many times in a row. Let's look at some more discussion, right? So we've left repetition because I've skipped over repetition which was on the previous slide because it's just saying the same exact same word again or changing it a bit like adding an S teacher teachers teaches teaching like that simple right synonyms are words that mean the same thing now brave means courageous uh, it may be that if you look in a dictionary uh, you will see some small differences in meaning between these two but as far as we're concerned, for most people, these would be synonymous, right? They would think of them as meaning the same thing. We're not talking about specialists who may uh, have some particular distinction between the two. We're talking about for most people, if they saw brave and they saw courageous in the same text, they would see that as a link, right? Uh, he was very courageous. She was very brave. They received a medal of gallantry. Right? You say, yeah, okay. So they were roughly equivalent, the bravery and the, and the courage, right? You wouldn't fuss about the difference. Uh, but, so the meaning is the same, but the level of formality might be different, right? You may find, you may think brave and courageous. Doesn't courageous sound a little more special, fancier, right? Uh, brave is probably the higher frequency word, right? High frequency, the one you use more often. It's not to say that you don't know the word courageous, but probably like most people, when you want to express this concept, you would say brave first and you would read brave more often and you would hear brave more often. Brave is more high frequency. Courageous is low frequency. 
you don't hear it as frequent, frequently, right? Often what happens is that low frequency words are more formal, right? We save, uh, we talk about bravery more commonly. We use courageous in formal situations, perhaps awarding someone uh, a medal, like I said earlier, you'd say for her courage in this situation, right? For this courageous display of heroism, like that, right? So they can be synonymous in meaning, but they're not synonymous in terms of register, right? In terms of register meaning formality. They're not synonymous in register, but they're synonymous in meaning. Think of these three here, go up, climb, ascend. You can probably picture that in terms of meaning, they are the same. In terms of formality, though, in terms of the register, they are different, right? I bet you rarely, if never, use ascend. It doesn't mean you don't know it, but it's probably highly likely that you have used go up a lot more often in the last few days than you used climb or ascend, right? Ascend appears in uh, uh, the Christian Bible, Jesus, uh, the, the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven, right? The Americans have a painting, the ascension of George Washington, right? Ascension is for special going up. Uh, go up is for every day, go up the stairs, right? Uh, so they mean the same thing, but the formality is different. Folk and people die and kick the bucket, right? All of these are synonymous in meaning, but different in formality. Not always in all situations, right? You can use the lecture was deep, or you can say the lecture was profound. Uh, deep is probably the more, not probably, deep is definitely higher frequency, right? We use deep more often. Profound is low frequency. As you can see here, often what happens is that the low frequency words like profound, low frequency, more formal words like profound tend to come from French, right? Earlier we had courageous French, uh, courage. Here we have uh, profound, profond. Uh, the, the French ones are the more formal, lower frequency ones. The Germanic roots, like, uh, I'm not actually sure, brave, but the, the ones that are not French in any case tend to be the ones that are more commonly used and less formal. Uh, and if you don't know French and German word origins, just think usually what it is is the longer one is more formal, right? Courageous is longer than brave. Profound is longer than deep. Uh, intelligent is longer than clever or smart, right? If it's longer, it's probably more formal. If it's longer, it's probably lower frequency. If it's longer, it probably comes from French. French words are just longer than German words often. Not always, but often. Okay, uh, you can use the lecture was deep, the lecture was profound, but when we're talking about literal depth, you cannot use profound anymore, right? The pool was deep, sounds fine. The pool was profound. The pool was profound does not sound correct. That's what the asterisk there is to mark that it's not correct or at least highly unusual, right? So metaphorical depth, the lecture was deep, the lecture was, was profound. Metaphorical depth can be referred to as profound. Literal depth cannot be referred to as profound or at least it would be highly unusual to do so. Uh, here's another good example, right? People sometimes talk about what does I'm, you know, is I'm sorry the same as I apologize? Sometimes bump someone on the street back and oh, I'm sorry, uh, oh, apologies, apologies, something like that, right? Sometimes it means the same thing. You can see that it doesn't always if you consider what happens if you say I'm sorry or if you say I'm apo I apologize at a funeral, right? I'm sorry at a funeral, I empathize with your loss. I apologize at a funeral, I killed him or her, right? Quite a bit different depending on the context in that case. So you can see that apologize sometimes then has the, is interpreted as I apologize for something I did 
Whereas I'm sorry for something that happened, which may not have anything to do with me having caused it, right? Uh, synonyms may differ in variety as well, variety of English. Linguists often use the term variety where people might say dialect, uh, but we often use the word variety instead, right? We'll talk about, you know, Canadian variety like I speak, British variety of English like probably you speak, although I realize you may not be from Britain, Australian variety, right? Within countries, you know, London variety, Liverpool variety, like that, right? Uh, synonyms sometimes differ according to the variety. That thing beside the road where you walk, British people tend to call it a pavement, Americans tend to call it a sidewalk, right? For Americans and Canadians, pavement is the material that covers the road, right? Uh, it means quite something quite different. In, in Britain, if you say, walk on the pavement, it means I, I care about you, be safe, walk beside the road, right? In Canada, if someone says walk on the pavement, it means I want you to walk in the road and get hit by a car. Why do you hate me already? You just met me, right? Uh, so the synonym differs. The word that you use is different depending on which variety of English you speak, but you mean the same thing. Baseboard and skirting board, there's innumerable examples, right, of where you're referring to the same thing, but depending on which variety of English you speak, you use a different word. Uh, this is a study, just as this is just an aside, right? This is what sociolinguistics is about, right? How the your social nature, man, woman, old, young, where you're from, America or Britain, or obviously any other place, how your social nature affects the way you are likely to talk. Uh, Superordinates and subordinates, you remember the superordinate and the subordinate, it's the relation where it's a type, the subordinate is a type of whatever the superordinate is. Uh, a poodle is a kind of dog, so poodle is a subordinate of dog. A dog is a subordinate of canine, right? There are other types of canine, wolf, fox, and so on. You can keep picture it like a hierarchy, right? Uh, mammal canine, dog, golden retriever, right? Everything above whatever is below is called a superordinate and the ones below are called subordinates. Uh, canine is a subordinate of animal, but you could look at it from the opposite point of view and say that animal is a superordinate of canine, animal is a superordinate of dog, animal is a superordinate of poodle, right? Anything higher up is referred to as the superordinate, anything down below is referred to as the subordinate. You will see in at least one of the uh, books that I recommended that you read and perhaps in other sources that sometimes this superordinate subordinate relationship is referred to as a hyponym and a hypernym, right? Hypo and hyper. Hypo means under, like a hypodermic needle goes under your skin, right? Uh, hyper. People talk about children being hyper sometimes, hyperactive, right, overactive. It doesn't matter. This is a good time to make this clear because it happened. This isn't the only time that this happens, right? Different people prefer different terminology. They mean the same thing, superordinate, subordinate, uh, hypernym, hyponym. I probably should write those the other way, super, sub, hyper, hypo. I apologize, it should say hyper first if I want to keep the same relationship. Which should you use? Sometimes people ask me that. They say, you know, don't these mean the same thing? Yes, they do. Use whichever one's easier to you remember, for you to remember. They're both correct, right? For me, super and sub is easier to remember than hyper and hypo. So I like super and sub. Whichever one works for you is fine. Here's some examples, right? To clarify the different types of reiteration. You can see that the same thing is happening here, right? The climb the peak, I turn to climb the peak. Climb, that, that idea of climb is repeated in example, is reiterated, sorry, is reiterated in number one, two, and three, but in different ways. The first one is quite obvious, climb. The climb was quite easy. Climb and climb is just repeated, the exact word. Climb and ascend, the ascent, uses a synonym, right? It's a different word, but you know, it means the same thing. The task was quite easy. Well, task could refer to 
task could mean anything that you have to work to achieve. But if you say the task was quite easy, in this case, you know that the task means climbing the peak was quite easy. And of course, just to compare to something we talked about in the past, you could just say it, right? It was quite easy. Uh, the climb, the ascent, the task, it, they're all interpreted as climbing the peak. So what's the difference? Well, the, why would you, I mean, what's the difference? One's a, re, one's repetition, one's a synonym, one's a superordinate, one's a reference. None of them is better than the other one, though. Sometimes people say, then why use one or the other? Well, that's, that's a question of style, right? Stylistics is the study of what choices does an author or speaker make and what effect is it supposed to have on the reader, right? Uh, I mean, saying it probably is the most minimal effect, right? It's easily comprehensible. Other choices are probably made for literary purposes. The task was quite easier, it just sounds nicer. It displays a bit more of your vocabulary, right? From a linguistic point of view, they're the same. From a stylistic point of view, they're different, right? They show a different style of language use. Some more examples, right? The boy is repeated as the boy. In number two, the synonym, the lad, is used. In number three, the superordinate, the child, is used. Right? A boy is a type of child. And you can probably guess that the reference will just be he, right? Good. So, what I was talking about in for the last several slides was reiteration, right? Saying the same thing again, but differences between types of reiteration. Repetition, use the exact same word. Synonym, same word, different meaning. Sorry, synonym, different word, same meaning. Superordinate and subordinate. Somewhere on the scale in the hierarchy, the two words are related because one is a type of the other. Collocation, the last one to talk about. As I said earlier, boys and girls, right? When girls are mentioned, the concept, topic, word, boys, it becomes more likely to appear because boys and girls are often discussed in the same text. Don't have to be, but it's more likely that girls and boys are discussed than say girls and turtles or girls and, uh, well, any other non-collocate, right? A word that might appear, but you don't expect it. Uh, so collocation, right? We've got words like high and tall, which sometimes are different, sometimes are the same, right? Tall mountain, tall man, possible high mountain, possible high man no longer has the same meaning as tall man, right? If you say tall mountain, high mountain, you probably think of those as meaning the same thing. A tall man and a high man don't mean the same thing. So what you could say here is that if we're talking about the distance from the ground to the top of something, for mountain, we have two possible collocations, right? Two possible collocates, or you can use the verb they collocate, right? Uh, tall and high collocate with mountain when you're talking about something's height. When you're talking about the height of a person, tall collocates, but high does not. Why not, right? Well, you can, you can get into the arguments about uh, the actual meaning of the words, which is, is possible, but sometimes for collocations, it's just, we don't say that because we don't say it. And there isn't really any good reason, right? If we're allowed, I mean, you can say, well, high means that it's distance from the ground uh, like if you said a high, the, you know, something about the high man, and you know, never mind drugs. If you said something about the high man, it would mean like there's a man who may be very short, but he's up on top of a building, so he's the high man and he's the low man, right? Because that one's on the ground, that one's up on the building. You could talk about things like that, but then so that high means you're up on top of something, but a high mountain. We say a high mountain, and we don't think the mountain has to be up on top of something. A high mountain doesn't have to be up on top of a building, right? So it may just be often, well, it is often the case that we don't say certain things that seem possible 
just because we don't, because they are not collocations. This is often a difficulty in learning a foreign language, is you'll ask native speakers of that language, why can't we say this? And they'll say, mm, we just don't. And they can't explain for any grammatical reason or any semantic reason. They'll say, we just don't. You'll see a couple of examples that I think will make this clear in a sec, right? Uh, look at this, right? This tweet that I found quite funny. Someone wrote, called a, called a restaurant to make a reservation, but couldn't think of the word, so asked for a food appointment, and now I can never show my face there again. Now, food appointment makes sense, right? You can see why Brittany might have said that, a food appointment. And why do we use appointment for many sort of services? You can make an appointment to get a haircut. You can make an appointment with the doctor, right? But for doing the exact same thing, right? Arranging a time to do something with the doctor is called an appointment. Arranging a time to do something for a haircut is called, can be called an appointment. Uh, arranging a time to get food is called a reservation. Why? Because that's the term we use, because it's a collocation, right? Restaurant, reservation, doctor, appointment. But food appointment makes sense. So that's often the case with collocations. You can see how it makes sense, but we just don't say it. Uh, think of something like brand new, a very strong collocation, right? What, what does brand mean here? Brand new means very new, right? Brand new, very new, brand new shoes, very new shoes. Uh, but you don't use brand with any other combination, right? I mean, can you say, uh, a, a brand good food to mean very good food? No, right? Can you say uh, brand friendly guy to mean he's a very friendly guy? No. Brand with new is a strong collocation where brand means very and it pretty much only appears with new. That's a very strong collocation. Brand and new go right side by side to mean very new. Brand does not appear with other adjectives, right? Or I shouldn't say does not appear. I just can't think of any off the top of my head, but it's very unusual, very unlikely. Save time, right? Strong collocation. Save time. Think about how, you know, in meaning to preserve time or conserve time would mean the same thing, right? You can, you can, you can save money uh, and uh, save, uh, uh, save the whales, right? It used to be a campaign. Uh, preserve and conserve sound not impossible, that's why the asterisk is good, but unusual, right? Uh, preserve money, conserve money, not so common, right? What do we do? Uh, but then those words may collocate with other things, like conserve energy is very common. Preserve energy, well, it kind of means the same thing, but we just don't say it. Save energy, that sounds possible, right? Save, preserve, conserve are roughly the same meaning, but you can see that certain of those verbs appear with certain nouns in patterns that can't really be explained without just saying, well, we just do that because that's what other people do. We've, we've heard speakers of English, primarily we hear, we learn our collocations from native speakers of English, native writers of English. People say save time, so I say save time. People say conserve energy, so I say conserve energy, and so on, right? Uh, fresh bread, stale bread, fresh bread, fresh breath, bad breath, right? What's the opposite of fresh bread, stale bread? What's the opposite of fresh breath, bad breath? It's not that you can't say stale breath, but if I, if you listen to television commercials for, for uh, toothpaste and so on, they'll say bad breath, right? You can have bad bread, but bad bread does not mean the same thing as stale bread, right? The opposite of fresh bread is stale bread. Bad bread could still be fresh, but it just doesn't taste good. So these are collocational patterns that go together to mean specific things. And if we mix in, well, either we don't mix and match them, or it's unusual, like stale breath. Sure, you could say that, but it's probably you'd say bad breath. We don't mix and match them, or if we do mix and match, they mean different things depending on the first word of the pair, right? Uh, stale bread uh, versus stale breath. Stale bread, we know what it is, right? Stale breath, I guess it's bad, but I can't picture exactly what you mean by it. Sometimes 
they're just, I think this is a very clear example where there doesn't really seem to be any reason for this, right? You're really nice, I really like you. Really and really, you probably accept both of those uh, as an intensifier, more, right? More nice, more like. Uh, when it comes to this one, you're very nice, I really like you. You probably think this sounds like natural English, right? you're very nice, I really like you. That very is also an, uh, for emphasis, to intensify, right? You're really nice, you're very nice. Both of them mean nicer than normal nice amount of niceness. When it comes to this though, then you're very nice, I very like you. Very like you does not seem possible, right? Uh, why not? Why can we say I really like you, but it sounds wrong to say I very like you? Well, the gr some people will point, they'll say, well, it's a grammar thing. Very plus adjective is okay. Very nice is okay. Very plus a verb is not okay. Very like is not okay. Yes, that's the grammatical reason. But what's the reason in meaning? Is there any reason in meaning that we can't say that when we know very means really? If they mean the same, why can't we use them? We just don't. It's a collocation that we just don't use. That's a common example right there of number three of the kind of thing that a non-native speaker of English may find troublesome and, and I think justifiably find annoying. If you can say very nice, why can't you say very like? You just can't. For some, yes, for a grammatical reason, but it's not a grammatical reason that really makes sense in terms of meaning. That's how collocations work. We just use the ones that we've heard and they sound good to us even when it doesn't always make sense. Now, what I was talking about there was a lot of examples of words that go right side by side. But you can also have words that can be referred to as in the same collocational field, right? It's like a field of grass with the various cows in it that are related because they're cows. The collocational field, the same thing. If you talk about a sun, then people, it becomes more likely that if a text mentions a sun, that it will also mention daughters, it will also mention parents, might be quite close together. Aunts and uncles would be further out in the field and grandparents further out in the field, right? Uh, further out in the field, you might have other things, right? Uh, age, right? If you're talking about your son, how old is he, right? Oh, he's five years old. Oh, he's 22 years old, right? Age might be further out. That's how a collocational field works. When Think of the center of the field is the mention of the word son. Closer in, we have things that we predict would be highly likely once a son is mentioned. Further out, things that, yeah, that's possible too. Way out though, we'd have things that aren't necessarily, or not in the field, would be words where we don't have any prediction that they would be related to a mention of son at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here I'm talking about a prediction. In reality, uh, as I'll show you in a bit, uh, linguists can use software uh, or counting methods to make quite accurate determinations of what counts as a collocation and what doesn't. Uh, uh, there's an example, right? Aubergine is probably not a collocation of sun. Why would you have any reason to believe that aubergine would turn up if you mention the word sun? You can probably do this now. If you mention girls, what would likely turn up? Maybe girls and boys, right? Girls and teachers, right? Imagine, you know, the teacher asks the girls and boys to begin their work, that sort of thing, right? Um, here, what we're going to see is some collocations means words that go together, right? Words that tend to appear together. I'm going to give you some more specific terms to refer to words that go together, right? So picture it like collocations. One type of collocation that you probably know is antonyms, right? Words that have an opposite meaning. You can see that these are collocations, right? If you talk about something, it becomes possible that you, more likely that you would also talk about the opposite of that thing. So antonyms are a type of collocation. Antonyms can be ungraded. You're one or the other, right? You're dead or you're alive. Those are antonyms and they're ungraded. You must be one or the other. Uh, you can enter or you can exit the room through the door. You can't do both at the same time, right? 
I can describe it from a different point of view, yes, that you exited this room and, and from the other point of view, you entered that room, but you can only do one or another from here. We do use these sometimes as if they were graded, as if you could be more than one, right? We say things metaphorically like he's barely alive, uh, but really he is alive, right? Literally, if you say he's barely alive, literally he's alive, right? Uh, running makes him feel alive. Well, if he's running, he is alive. But again, you're using this metaphorically here to mean that those connotations of being alive, active, energy, breathing, running makes him feel more active, more energetic, right? So we sometimes use them as if they're graded, but in literal sense, you can only be dead or alive. Those are ungraded antonyms. Graded then, as you can see, are those antonyms that exist on a scale, big or small, right? Uh, you can be both big or small depending on what we're talking about, right? I am big compared to my daughter's gerbils. I am small compared to an elephant, right? Um, brave and cowardly and so on, right? You, someone's point of view, that's brave. Someone else's point of view, that's cowardly, right? I mean, you know, in any sort of war situation, right? Uh, bravery would be defined as one way by people on my side, as cowardly by people on the other side. That mouse is big, that elephant is small, right? You could obviously say those things. That mouse is big compared to other mice, right? That mouse is big compared to rice, a piece of rice. That elephant is small compared to the moon and so on. Finally, relational antonyms is when they exist as a pair because of the other in terms of point of view, right? If I am buying something from you, you are selling it to me. It's the same action is happening in the world, but from my point of view, it's described as buying it. From your point of view, it's described as selling it. Uh, teacher and student, right? Teachers and students are not opposites in many ways. I mean, if I say my job is a teacher and she says her job is a plumber, those two, those are our jobs, but they're not opposite in any way, right? But if I describe myself in relation to students, then we feel like it's opposite. And it doesn't mean oppositional. We're not arguing with each other. In our relationship, we are doing the opposite thing. I'm, I hope, giving you information and you are, I hope, getting the information. Uh, it, it's the fact that there, you need the other one, right? If I say I'm a teacher, yes, I can say I'm a teacher. It means I need students. If I don't have any students, am I really a teacher? I was a teacher, right? But if I don't have any students, am I really a teacher? I mean, it's not like I need the students now, but if I don't have them habitually, hopefully learning from me, then I'm not really a teacher, am I? Uh, a few minor notes here, you know, uh, you may find that you may find interesting is, is often why I say these things, right? Uh, when you have these pairs of antonyms, one is usually semantically unmarked or neutral. What does this mean? There's one by unmarked, it means the default one, the usual one, the, the one we say in more situations, right? Think of this. We say, how old are you? And nobody blinks, right? How old are you? If you say, how young are you? Suddenly it becomes marked. Think of it like that, marked, it, noticeable, right? Like if I've got my five fingers up and one has a big black X on it, which one are you gonna look at? You're gonna look at the marked one, right? You're gonna notice it. Uh, so that's what that means, right? That's often the case. How old are you is the usual question. How young are you? You immediately go, hmm, why would he say that? Uh, does he think I'm particularly young for some reason? Uh, similarly for high or low, you can probably do it, right? Which one is the semantically unmarked one? Which one do you use more often, right? You say things like, how high is that mountain? Not how low is that mountain? Uh, yes. We often formally mark antonyms to make it really clear. We use words like on and in and this, right? It's possible uh, to mark the antonym, the negative one, to mark it. Doesn't always work that way, right? Disappoint is not the opposite of a point. Dismay is not the opposite of may. So, of course, you're going to be thinking of the meaning of these words. Uh, sometimes it appears at the end of the word rather than at the start, right? Uh, lion, lioness, actor, actress, bachelor, bachelorette, 
you can see what's happening there, of course, that the unmarked form lion actor bachelor is male, uh, the marked form is female. That is uh, quite common in English and in many languages, right? That it's the female form that gets marked somehow, in this case, by a suffix. Meronyms. A meronym means that you know that there's a relation between the two words and that they're more likely appear together as collocations because one is a part of the other, right? Leaf, bark, and branch are all parts of a tree. Uh, clutch, engine, and brake are parts of a car. You would see the relationship, right? If I say, I need to get my car fixed, the engine is broken. You would not be confused, right? You need, I need to get my car fixed, the engine's broken. You would see the relationship, the cohesion, because you would say, all oh, right, engine is a part of a car. That's not the same. Sometimes people confuse this, right? Superordinate and subordinate mean it's a type of. Meronym means it's a part of, right? Uh, maple is a subordinate of tree because maple is a type of tree. Bark is a meronym of tree because bark is part of a tree. So, collocations, words that appear together more frequently than chance would indicate. They're usually content words, right? Content words, nouns, verb, adjectives, adver adverbs, not usually talking about the function words like the and to, 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 and so on, in, out. They help us understand the meaning right? Collocations, think of struck, right? The, if I ask you what struck means, you'd say it has many meanings, probably, I mean, they're related, but you'd picture them differently depending on which collocation they appear with, right? A clock striking is different than a minor striking is different than a boxer striking. Uh, although the words have that same root element of uh, some sort of hitting, uh, it's not, it's quite different. The boxer striking is with force in order to hurt someone. The clock striking is probably with minimal force because it doesn't want to break the bell. It's got to hit it hard enough and so on, right? So there are differences that the collocate helps us determine what the struck means, right? Think of that with these here. I'm, I'm stopping talking so you can actually pause and think about it for a minute. Right, yes, yeah, so and now that you've come back, you'll see, right, that we have this word white, but here even more than with struck, I think it really means different things depending on which word it collocates with, right? And, and white noise is especially odd because is there any, when you talk about white noise, that like a white noise machine that creates a background hum that's supposed to reduce distractions, as far as I know, I've never, I've never used one, right? But uh, how is that white in any sense that the other ones are white, right? I mean, you can see white person with a light colored skin, white coffee could be quite dark, but it's got milk in it. White paint is probably the most literally white of all of those. White noise has to be some sort of metaphorical whiteness uh, that isn't really connected to the, the literal color at all. As I said, much earlier, it's off for our purposes. It's enough to think of to use your intuition, right? Do those words seem to go together? Sure. What linguists do, and and especially those who use computational linguistics, collocation, concordance programs, I'll show you what that is in a second. They use software, right, to come up with things like this. Uh, looking at the word rabbit, and they'll end up with lists like this, where you see rabbit. And then you can see a lot of the words that appear right beside rabbit. So you see the is obviously quite a strong collocation. The rabbit goes together quite frequently. Uh, but the doesn't tell us much because it's a word that could appear with any noun, right? White and rabbit, oh, that's interesting. So white appears with it, and then you might realize that's Alice in Wonderland. Large rabbit appears down below, right? So you can see that there's a lot of uh, various collocations immediately with it. And if we look at the on the right side, what comes up with rabbit, uh, rabbit hole appears quite a few times, right? We have rabbit and some verbs like rabbit asked, rabbit began, rabbit blew. So, you know, oh, okay, so rabbit collocates with verbs. 
uh, and it appears right before verb. So then you could start to guess, oh, so it's probably a noun, right? Because noun verb is a common combination. I'm not saying you have to remember any of this. I'm just talking through how people use concordance software for a bit. And, and you may do this in another class in the future in more detail. But for now, just so you can get a picture of how do we actually determine what our collocations are not. And I'm only now looking at the words immediately before and after the word rabbit. You might get into the collocational field and look at what words and what types of words appear within three or four or five words of the word rabbit and continue like that to do your analysis of collocations. Collocations may reflect social attitudes. This is very interesting. Uh, I started to say it earlier when I talked about lion, lioness, actor, actress, and then I decided to hold off until here, but you may have had some intuition about that, of course, right? Uh, women collocates with beautiful. You're more likely to hear a woman described as, a beautif as beautiful. You're more likely to hear a man described as handsome. In both of those cases, we mean the same thing, right? Beautiful and handsome are talking about physical appearance. And yet for some reason, well, not for some reason, you, you can think about why, right? That we just think of, or at least we're forced to describe for the most part, male and female beauty differently. It's not that you can't say a handsome woman or a beautiful man, of course you can, but you don't tend to hear that, right? Uh, the societal attitude here has to do with people thinking that there are fundamental distinctions between men and women that have to be described in different ways, right? Um, many of those terms that you saw earlier, lion, lioness, would probably be uncontroversial. But actor and actress, for example, is now used a lot less, right? Uh, female practitioners of that art will often call themselves actors, right? They don't like the sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit marginalization of the S form, that the women's form is somehow less, so they'll describe themselves as actors. Uh, male and female looks are described separately in that case. And again, this is the kind of thing that you'd probably talk about more about the why. I'm just talking about the what happens. Why does it happen is something left that you discuss more in a class on social linguistics, on discourse analysis. Okay, you've been very tolerant, very patient. The last thing is just to show you an example, right? Pause and read this. Now we'll look at all the different collocations you see, right? We have collocations to do with mountains, right? Mountain, where is a mountain? It's in the wilderness. Mountains have a summit. Mountains have a peak. The connection between mountains is called the ridge. Down below, if you have mountains, you have a valley. We also have the, the collocational field to do with avalanches. Avalanches happen with snow. Snow is in the north or the extreme south, of course, if you're in the southern part of the world. Uh, then we have collocations to do with uh, vision, right? In fact, C and C is repetition, the same word again. Spotted and watched are uh, synonyms. Again, not exactly synonymous, but related, right? You have once and unusual in purple there that go together as synonyms. Add in some more here. Uh, what did I just add? Oh, the grammatical cohesion. Look at the word it is now in, it's in gray, it's in bold and gray. It contributes to the grammatical cohesion. Uh, it, the first it refers to seeing a snow avalanche in Yosemite. You're seeing that here, uh, w uh, you know, with your studies today and uh, the reference from earlier, right? Look at how many of the words are related to other parts of the text. This is that uh, web, that spider's web that was described in one, that was uh, explained in one of the first slides, right? The numerous connections between different parts of the text that help us show that it's related, that it's cohesive, one word, one clause, to other words, other clauses. So that's the overview, again, of what I hope you've learned today. References are here. Thank you very much. Goodbye.